Yo woi. Wanya. Wanya ngalam. Wanya ngalam jamangku. Wanya yen jaran wanya yen jaran kan. Karena nenami jojo mo birono kayan man morangai jagon kun kan nyonko. Pilih nenaju banyak-banyak jimi cakan bara no jono jundul-jundul goji. Yo woi. Ngara. Wanya. Uh, hello. My name is Lyndon Davis, uh, descendant of the traditional custodians from uh, the Malula Plains District, and uh, very privileged to, to be here as part of the uh, the field trip symposium. Uh, I'll be, you know, one of your, one of the key speakers uh, as part of the uh, the program. But you know, that's uh, a privilege for me to be a part of, but also a privilege for me to be here to also say one uh, on behalf of uh, my ancestors from Malula Plains. Uh, great great grandmother was born here in the 1850s, and basically that's who we uh, get the opportunity to speak on behalf and to use her language. Wanya is the word for welcome. We uh, represent Malula Plains people. Malula Bar refers to the red belly black snake. Uh, but be on, on behalf of the families, we'd like to uh, welcome you all. Also acknowledge our elders, past and present. I acknowledge the Yinnabara people, our neighbouring clan there. Uh, part of the Kapi Kapi language group or, or Waka Waka. Uh, but, you know, they are uh, our neighbours and so acknowledge them. Also, Torres Strait Island families around the uh, district and uh, South Sea Island families. So, uh, on behalf of the family, Wanya. So, as part of the welcome, I'll play a bit of ditch. Play a bit of ditch for you. And um, this is a great instrument. It's from North Queensland. So, I'd like to use it as a welcoming gesture. Welcome all the good people and to welcome all the good spirits. Here's a bit of yiggy yiggy. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Field Trip. Uh, my name is Leah Barclay, and thank you so much to Lyndon Davis for that beautiful welcome to country. I would also like to start by acknowledging Gubby Gubby Country and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. So we're super excited to be presenting Field Trip to you today. Field Trip is an international research symposium that's really investigating creative practice at the intersection of art, science, technology and the environment. And this is the second iteration of the Field Trip Symposium. Um, after we presented the first fully online event in 2020. Um, so this year, the event is presented as a hybrid. It's both live and digital, and it's bringing together a pretty incredible range of artists and researchers and really exploring the ethics of interdisciplinary art and some of the current research that's happening in art science collaborations, particularly here on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. So, Field Trip as an event is really about bringing all of these new ideas together and exploring really how vital creativity is in responding to the climate crisis and, and reimagining our future. And so, you know, as part of this event, we're not really focused on doom and gloom. We're really looking at ways that we can collaborate, that we can work together in these interdisciplinary partnerships and collaborations and see new ideas that can really help us to address some of the most challenging issues of our time. 
So we've got a full program today. It's going to be a massive day. We've got some truly incredible presenters, but I'd also like to start by acknowledging some of our partners. Our field trip is presented in partnership with Artsfront, this incredible platform that we're joining you on today, and they're hosting the live streams and the digital platform throughout the day. So please join us in the chat, give our presenters, you know, questions and feedback and comments and have a good look around at all of the presenter profiles and the delegates' profiles to see who you can connect and collaborate with. Um, Field Trip is also presented in partnership with Horizon Festival, an incredible local festival here on the Sunshine Coast, which is supporting so many interdisciplinary projects that we're presenting today. And the USC Art Gallery, the School of Business and Creative Industries here at USC and the USC Makerspace are all at the University of the Sunshine Coast, where many of us are streaming from today. So as part of the program, we really are truly going on a field trip. We're gonna be moving from presenting new works, keynotes and panels online, to transient artist talks this afternoon through the Marucci Botanic Gardens with the Final Call exhibition. And then moving to the USC Art Gallery for artist talks and showcases before we close tonight with some live performances. And the program this morning is going to open with the premiere of a new creative work called Lifeblood uh, by Jason Murphy. Jason is a Unibara artist who grew up in West End in Brisbane and really retains strong links to his country. And he dates the beginnings of his artistic career back to the age of seven, when he started to draw and paint stories. And his artworks really depict the narratives of people and place. And he feels like culture is a growing thing, uh, always moving and always alive. So this is Jason's new work, Lifeblood, the first creative work we're presenting today on the program.
incredible work there from Jason Murphy. What an amazing way to start the day with, with completely different perspectives of country with his new project, Lifeblood. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us today, Jason. Uh, we're now going to move on to the first keynote in the program with Lyndon Davis, who welcomed us to country this morning. And Lyndon is a internationally acclaimed artist, educator and cultural performer. He was born and raised here on the Sunshine Coast, and he is a traditional custodian and representative of the local Cubby Cubby people. And his work as a visual artist is held in national and international collections. And he's been commissioned by various high profile organizations, museums and art collectors. His um, experimental art practice has been commissioned for festivals, particularly here on the Sunshine Coast, including Floating Land, and Horizon Festival, where he's presented major new works and developed immersive installations and interactive experiences and large scale projection artworks that really feature his cubby cubby designs. And so we're really lucky to have Lyndon giving us a keynote today on some of his latest research and his latest project, Biali, which was commissioned by the Australian Network for Art and Technology, one of our partners on this program as part of the New Light program. And so he was one of three artists selected nationally to participate in this commission. And Biali is part of an emerging body of work in art science collaborations that Lyndon has been leading more recently. And I was really privileged to collaborate with him on this project, along with Dr. Tricia King here at USC, to really start exploring new ways we can collaborate and connect ideas around this art science research. So Lyndon's keynote for field trip today is presented in two parts. The first now in video form and the second tonight where he will be presenting Biali live at dusk here on campus at USC. Uh, one year, uh, my name is Lyndon Davis, uh, traditional custody of the, the Malula Plains, uh, Cubby Cubby speaking people. Uh, very uh, privileged to be here as a part of the uh, field trip symposium and to, uh, I suppose, present our Biali project. So um, Biali is, um, is an Aboriginal word in, in Kabi Kabi language, and it does talk about uh, the call. Yali is the call and Biali is the call loudly. And um, so that's what this uh, project's all about, the sounds uh, in our landscape and uh, a little bit of a study of the sounds. And as you can see, study of sound is called cymatics. Cyma is the Greek word for, for sound. And so, yeah, cymatics is the, is the study uh, of sound, which is uh, exactly what I'm um, doing as part of this Biali project. And uh, artwork uh, is, is definitely involved in, uh, in this project. I'm a bit of an artist. I've been an artist now for 20, 30 years, something like that. I've lost count, but um, it was a great opportunity to incorporate my artwork into this project. Uh, Biali, yes, uh, is commissioned by Anat, and uh, I was, um, I suppose, yeah, commissioned as three, three artists in Australia to, uh, to exhibit at the uh, Illuminate Festival at, at Adelaide for, a, oh, it was a couple of, couple of nights there, there that, and uh, so that was something that was very um, different for me. I, I'm not really, you know, um, get into that sort of world of, um, artwork as much as, as doing Crobbery and Song and Dance and you know but to do this uh, Biali and to be on uh, national um, headlines uh, it, it's pretty it's pretty important and uh, I was just privileged to be a part of it. Yes and uh, his picture of the artwork uh, as I was talking about my artwork was getting incorporated into this project and uh, in particular the sound that we wanted to study and really look at was the black cockatoo. And I see the black cockatoos around here all the time. I paint about them all the time. I know the story, we dance about them. And so uh, I thought my artwork uh, incorporated in this project would, would work beautifully. And uh, yet in, in our uh, sort of set up to, to uh, get the project uh, going as we had to go get our, our uh, content we had to go and get the sounds and calls of, of nature. And so we went up to the Mulaney 
bird century and um, we went right in there and we were taking photos with them. Uh, they were squawking around, talking to us in our ears and gnawing on our hats. But it was a really good opportunity to uh, get right up and close and personal because I've never been seriously that close. Look at it, right next to my binung there. I've never been that close to a, a black cockatoo, I'll tell you I was true. Um, but it was a great experience and we could hear them right up close, personal, their, their proper call to, so we could get those really good sounds and recordings. And, uh, and yeah, make our project really good. And so, you know, the photos too were awesome. Um, that's one thing that uh, part of the project that was just sort of uh, opened my mind up um, when we were using the photos in the imaging. Uh, I'll talk about that as well, but I mean, what I mean by imaging. But um, yeah, then, then we were in the, um, in the lab and we we're experimenting with the sounds and, and putting different mediums on top of the speaker to see the different patterns because cymatics is all about the study of sound and, and what sound actually looks like. And so, you know, to, to make it visual, we had to put something uh, that could be seen on top of the speakers like water mixed in with ochre. And then, you know, you put the sound of the black cockatoo through that and then you'll get this particular uh, pattern shape. And um, yeah, we could see it through the water and the, and the clay pretty good, but the interesting thing was, you know, like um, there was a couple of other mediums that we used. We didn't only use water and ochre. Um, we also used, which, yeah, which really spun me out. Um, I didn't think, but yeah, they, here's some of the images of the water up and close. Uh, when you can see the, the, the uh, sound being projected through the speaker and the actual pattern that it projected in the water, very uh, geometric pattern. And, um, you know, a lot of our artwork is all to do about geometric patterning. And so this was just complemented artwork and you can see where it all sort of connects up. And this is just using different colors. We were using yellows to reds. We're basically using the colors of the black cockatoo. He's got the yellow through him, he's got the red through him, he's got the black through him, he's got the white through him. And so we're basically uh, using those different colored mediums to see the difference in the, in the patterning. And this was the interesting one too, uh, the, when the light projected on it that were sort of set up from above it uh, and we put the speaker through, we mixed the different ochres with the yellows um, and the reds and the whites. And, um, but you know, when you get out at a particular angle on it and, and um, have a look at the pattern, it sort of, uh, it, it, you know, details even more into even more patterning. But, uh, you know, just capturing that um, was really my first time of doing cymatics. I've seen a lot of it being done everywhere else, everyone else doing on YouTube. But this is actually my first um, really attempt hands on with Leah at the lab at the university to, to see, see what it's like and, and, you know, hands on. And this is, yeah, this is just, uh, you know, us experimenting with um, a bit of a red ochre mixed in with the black and see how the black and the red would mix through when the sound sort of come through it. Once again, another picture of the water and the, the very detailed sort of patterns in the water that was coming out, which was um, very interesting. That's us in the lab, just me mixing the sounds of the uh, cockatoos with the, the sounds of the didgeridoo, uh, which was, you know, complementing each other. Uh, not overpowering, the didge wasn't overpowering the, the cockatoo sounds, the cockatoo wasn't overpowering the didge. They were really just to complement each other and it was a really uh, good experience. And, um, you know, to play along with them and to see what the pattern uh, is different from just having the cockatoo by itself to the didge by itself. And then you put them both together and, you know, totally another pattern sort of appears, which is, you know, which I, what I always thought. But, um, yeah, it was just good to hands on use the space here at the university grateful for Leah and Trish to you know to to help us out with the, this project and get it up and running um you know without their expertise I wouldn't um a presentation wouldn't be this good that's for sure but that's like a sonogram there that um Leah specializes in study of sound as well she's a sound engineer so I think it was perfect for me to come and talk to her about sound and what she knows and yeah yeah, that was, that's the essence. That's what we really, that's, that's the sound. And um, you hear that everywhere. And, uh, and uh, I did a black cockatoo of a, 
um, a painting of Black Hawk too many years ago. It's here at the university. It's actually in the vice chancellor's office. So <laughs> we had to we had to borrow it for this um for this photo. But we actually see this is see now look there we go there it is. See how in the other images I showed you we used sand, we used ochre, we used water. Well, um, unbeknownst to me, uh, Leah sort of made me aware of this. She was sort of saying, well, you're using water and you're using ochre. Why don't you use a painting as your medium? And I honestly tell you the honest truth, I never thought that that would work. I didn't even know that existed. But see, as I said, you get with the right people that know their things, they can say, well, maybe you should try this. And I didn't know it existed. And Leah said, well, try it. And it worked. And so that picture that you see, that is a picture of the tail feather, or the bottom part of my black cockatoo painting showing the sort of half of his body coming down to his tail feather, a bit of his wing. And once we projected the sound through that picture, these are the patterns that appeared, which was mind blowing for me. I, I didn't think, as I said, I didn't think some of this stuff existed. So, not to just use water, not to just use ochre and put it on the speaker and put the sound through it. No, you put the picture on top of the speaker and well, you know, not literally, but <laughs> <laughs> digitally, you know, the technology you got these days, you can do this sort of business. So, and these are the beautiful infinite, I'd have to say infinite, that would be the best way to describe them because they are infinite, they go on forever. Uh, and it just comes from one part of my painting, which was the tail feather. But yeah, you know, as I said, using those colours, we made sure that we use red, black and yellow. And here, look, now this, this is interesting too, because this is just a picture, a photograph of the ochre. And then you put the photograph of that ochre, the one that you just saw with the pile of it, and then you put that through the sound there, that, 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 you put that, over the top of the speaker and project the sound through it. And this is what it turned into. These beautiful geometric patterns, which I always knew would have, you know, there'd be something I knew it was gonna give me something, but I did not know to this scale. And here's another one, a photo. This is the medium, it's the photo. And look, when you put it through the speaker, the photo, this is the pattern. That a picture of a white cockatoo's face with this little head feather there, you know? Um, amazing. I was uh, quite impressed, um, blown away by the, uh, the patterns that came out of a, a picture of a black, a white cockatoo, sorry. And yeah, they see these patterns that are coming through. We also recorded the white cockatoo. So when we put the white cockatoo picture, we projected the white cockatoo call through the picture, which created this. And which you will notice, is different to the black cockatoo call. But there is another great example of just uh, the feather, the under of the, and look what it turned into when she projected the white cockatoo sounds through the, the actual wing. And look at the patterns came out of it. It was amazing. And um, I, I was just uh, totally blown away by the whole project. Um, I remember when I, we'd sort of, you know, uh, we went, uh, we did for the whole day recording, doing stuff in the lab and took a lot of photos. And then the next day I was pretty drained, but I came back the next day and Leah said, well, why don't you put the photos underneath the, uh, on top of the um, speaker and see what patterns project through the actual photos. And these are the ones, these are the ones. So that picture, that picture, just the, the bit of his neck, this is what it, uh, it turned into when we put the black cockatoo call so we made sure we kept it true. Any black cockatoo photos, we made sure we put a black cockatoo call through it. And if there's a white cockatoo, see, look at that. That's different, similar, same, same, but different um, to the white cockatoo. That's the black cockatoo, this one. And as you notice, the white cockatoo had different colors, but look at, eh, amazing. Um, it looks like bunya trees at the top, you know, bunya trees at the top, bunya trees at the bottom. Uh, it's very detailed. You could get a micro, uh, you know, like a, a magnifying glass and, and really get up close and personal. And you could just probably see into a kaleidoscope, uh, just infinite patterns going forever. 
but uh, that's that's what our world is. It's very geometric. It's a geometric world, and so once you start experimenting with some of the sounds, you start to see the, these um, geometrical shapes and patterns. And there, that's an, that's another great one. Once again, Leah, she said, put the picture of the water over the top of the speaker and see what it turns into. And this is what it turned into. These beautiful, geometric, uniformed, perfect, you could call them perfect to me. Uh, got a little spirit about them. They feel like spirit. You know, water's got spirit. Water's through us. There's 70% uh, water through the body, 70% water on the land. And so we can communicate with water really, really well because we are water. And so I thought that's a really good medium to, to capture uh, some of the sounds using water as well. But uh, yeah, overall, this was just uh, the best project. Um, I can't wait to do more. I can't wait to do the seagull tail next. <laughs> I can't wait to do the carpet snake pattern. I mean, you know, you'd have to get up real close to get the sound of a carpet snake, but he does make a sound and you could capture that and magnify the sound. And then you'd see this beautiful pattern come out of it. I know you would, because if I've, we've done it, experimented with black copper two calls and the patterns that we came up with was like this. I, I just cannot wait to see uh, the other uh, animals in this uh, big animal kingdom that we have here on planet Earth. But on um, behalf of the families, uh, thank you very much for letting me speak for a little bit about Biali Project uh, as part of the uh, Field Trip Symposium. Wanya. Thanks so much, Lyndon. It's, it's really so amazing to hear Lyndon talk about his practice and it's a total privilege to have him keynote this symposium. He was a big part of the initial ideas of Field Trip. And as you can see, He's doing such impressive and original work that's, that's really at the forefront of what we can be doing with art science collaborations at the moment. And thanks also to Dr. Trisha King, who was a big part of taking a lot of the photos involved in the Biali project as well. Um, so if you are here on the Sunshine Coast, we would very much encourage you to come to the in-person program this afternoon and hear Lyndon speak further about the Biali project and see Biali itself projected large scale on the side of the building, which is the Queensland premiere of this work after it was screened as part of the Illuminate Adelaide Festival uh, with the Australian Network for Art and Technology earlier this year. Um, so I am going to hand the stream over now to the incredible Megan Williams, who is a core part of the field trip team and is the manager and curator at the USC Art Gallery. And Megan is also the curator of the Final Call exhibition, which is such an incredible exhibition. And it's uh, a total privilege to have this exhibition featured as part of the field trip symposium as well. And the next section of the program is really gonna focus on final call. So I'm gonna hand you over to Megan now. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thanks so much, Leah, for that very generous introduction. Um, so I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Cubby Cubby people. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders um, and acknowledge them as the first artists, mark makers and storytellers of this region. Um, so by way of a little bit of context, back in 2019, I was um, invited by Horizon Festival to curate an exhibition for the Maruchi Bushland Botanic Gardens. Um, and if you've been out there, it's, it's a really stunningly gorgeous environment. And I couldn't think about the natural beauty of the location uh, without simultaneously thinking about climate change. I mean, the physical impacts um, of climate change are really impossible to ignore. Climbing temperatures, rising sea levels, ocean acidification, extended droughts um, and bushfires are just some of the symptoms of um, our changing environment. Uh, and in many ways, I guess I was also thinking about how major climactic events um, had almost become expected or even the norm. Um, and with these events comes both, I guess, anxiety in the lead up to them and then trauma in the aftermath. Um, so this coupled with the scientific reality of, you know, this ecological, this global ecological breakdown um, that we are facing uh, can sometimes feel pretty overwhelming. Um, 
but my thinking around the exhibition was how do we not fall down that rabbit hole, you know, this rabbit hole of doom and gloom and, and often anger. Um, and this is probably going to sound uh, a little bit cheesy and maybe a bit Pollyanna-ish, but I kept thinking, how could this be an opportunity to inspire hope um, in the face of environmental crisis? And um, I really think that um, given everything that's going on at the moment, we could all do with a little bit of hope. Um, so I decided that I'd bring together a group of artists who I considered to work in really open-ended ways to respond to these ideas. Uh, I wasn't too concerned if they hadn't worked in the space of climate change directly um, in the past. Um, what I felt was important was that their practices were empathetic to the topic, but also um, sympathetic to the environment. Um, so a key part of the development of the exhibition was an artist camp that was held in late January of this year. Um, and through the artist camp, the artists and the project team got to spend two days immersed in the Botanic Gardens. Uh, and during this time, we engaged in conversations with Cubby Cubby leaders, uh, local and international environment and climate change experts, creative researchers, and also each other. Um, and I think that this was really critical in terms of understanding both the big picture impacts of climate change, um, but it's the same time the nuances um, at a local level. Um, and I just wanted to um, particularly thank Ani Helena Goulash and Lyndon Davis who spent um, time with us and shared with us. Um, and also acknowledge that all of the exchanges that we had were incredibly generous and honest. Um, and I think that this really comes through in the resulting works that the artists produced. Um, so the exhibition begins with um, a gesture from Courtney Coombs. Their work invites us to move past climate change helplessness uh, by focusing on the little things within our control. Caitlin Fransman um, then brings our attention and conversation to other really small things, the magic and wonder of the world at our feet. Judy Watson, Ani Helena Goulash and Tor McLean's collaborative work makes us look up through and into the environment and also at the same time advocates for the place of Australian Aboriginal knowledge systems in responding to climate change. Uh, Itamar Freed and Courtney Shu contemplate what is at stake if we don't look closely at the impacts of human intervention in the landscape. And the exhibition concludes as gently as it begins with a really delicate and ephemeral work by Robert Andrew that draws our attention to the interconnectedness of all living things. Um, I guess if I was asked to sum up final call in one word, it would be gentle. The works really encourage us, as does the environment um, that they're in, to slow down and appreciate the beauty, wonder and history of the natural world. Um, and in turn, I think this um, makes us consider what the world would be like without it. So another really important outcome of the project um, and a major undertaking is an amazing digital experience. Um, and I'm going to give you, I'm gonna screen share and give you a quick preview of that right now. Um, so, um, this is this wonderful um, digital experience that um, has been created by, created and conceptualized by um, the Horizon team. Um, and it was developed by a local company, Various Artists. I just want to acknowledge that. And it includes um, films by a local filmmaker, Timothy Birch, that um, unpack the artist's creative process. There's also wonderful videography of the final works in situ um, and um, also a 360 degree um, video of the works in situ as well. And so I guess the intention with this was that we could share this exhibition with as, um, as broad an audience as possible, a global audience in fact. Um, and as you can see, if you want to visit that experience, you just have to head to horizon.com.au forward slash final call. Um, and if you're in the position to um, visit the exhibition, it will be in situ at the gardens until Sunday, the 17th of October. Um, okay, Leah, I think you can finish screen sharing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so I just wanted to um, finish up by acknowledging uh, the generosity of the staff and volunteers at the Maruchi Bushland Botanic Garden. They were incredible, but also the scientists that participated in our artist camp, Helen Fairweather and Neil Tyndale from USC um, and Robin Matthews from the IPCC. Um, and of course, um, I really want to acknowledge um, the artists who really embraced the project with such great sensitivity. Um, so we're now actually going to hear from two of the artists that were involved in Final Call. Um, and first up, we have Courtney Coombs. Um, Courtney is fascinated by the potential and power of connection and disconnection. They explore this by reimagining everyday moments in a range of materials and approaches, um, creating subjective, vulnerable and earnest artworks that prompt different ways of seeing, understanding and being. So we're going to begin Courtney's session uh, by sharing her studio tour from the Final Call platform with you. Um, and then we'll move into um, a talk from her. So over to you, Courtney. My name is Courtney Coombs. I grew up all over the place. I was born in Sydney and then I currently live in Brisbane, Mianjin. I think I'm an artist because it's, it's the best way I know how to try and figure out how to be in this world. My practice involves a lot of thinking, reflecting on being, intuition. For me, my practice is about finding a way to connect and communicate, and then that takes the forms of many different approaches, I guess. It's usually gestural, it's usually um, minimal, I'm really interested in ambiguity because I, I don't want to be overly didactic in my work and I want to create a space where the person looking at the work can draw something from it as well. But it's also highly personal, I suppose. Nature was always like a weekend trip, I think. Like I grew up in the suburbs in Melbourne and while it was a green suburb, you know, and I loved those big trees that lined the street. I think it, it was a place to go rather than something that surrounded me. It was a way that I kind of thought about it. Yeah, it was, it was a trip. It was a, um, a something outside of the everyday. It was a place to be a kid and be free, but it was definitely over there, I think. It's a place to feel whole, isn't it, I think. In a way, it still is an escape for me. It's, it's I think, and maybe that relates to how I was able to encounter it as a child or how I was kind of directed. It's always a place where I can go, which is interesting to reflect on, think and find clarity. The themes that I'm thinking about currently for the work, the sites specifically, but then also metaphorically, thinking about the idea of here and what that might be. I think one of the things that was most exciting to learn was that there was hope still. Learning from the experts in the field that there is, uh, there are things we can do on an individual level that can make an impact was really exciting. The reason I love art so much is that it helps us see the world differently. If at least one person walked away from the work and saw the world slightly differently, then that would be a nice thing. I think that's a really beautiful um, sentiment that Courtney ends on there um, in terms of if one person can walk away um, feeling changed by the experience and that's, that's a positive. Um, so Courtney is actually currently studying a Masters of Fine Arts in um, Bergen in Norway. Um, and so because of the time difference, um, couldn't join us in person, but has really generously pre-recorded um, uh, an artist talk that um, expands on um, her work for, um, for um, Final Calls, which is called Sometimes It's the Little Things. Um, so I'll hand over to Courtney. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. And I'm sorry that this is a pre-recorded video. I was really hoping to be able to um, 
join you live by Zoom at least, but of course the um, uh, time difference was a little bit tricky to navigate um, from where I'm currently based, which is in Bergen um, in Norway. And I've got um, behind me a picture that I took recently, um, which I thought was kind of relevant to our discussion today because it's of this beautiful glacier that's um, in Finse, which is two and a half hours east of where I'm currently living. And it's um, uh, an incredible place. And But from what I understand, the glacier is a very, very small fraction of the size that it has been, of course, in past time. So I think it was a very clear um, and obvious uh, uh, um, illustration of the uh, climate crisis, I suppose. So I thought um, it was a nice, a nice way to visually represent that um, in the context of the conversation today. Um, so I'm talking about my work um, as part of the incredible um, exhibition that Megan has curated and I felt um, was an incredible privilege to be part of because I've learned so much actually through the process of um, uh, developing the work and engaging with the site that the exhibition is placed on and I feel very fortunate to have had that experience. Um, as we know, the exhibition is kind of centered around um, the issue of climate change. But um, from the first conversation that Megan and I had, she was very much interested in trying to find a place of hope as an outcome, because of course, this idea of um, the destruction of our world through um, climate change can be incredibly overwhelming and I certainly feel that and have felt that um, before so I thought it was a really um, earnest and uh, productive I guess um, way to engage with this topic because um, yeah it can feel it can feel incredibly overwhelming and actually I've been rereading uh Susie Gablick's book um Conversations Before the End of Time which was written in the 90s and could have been written yesterday which uh can feel a little uh sad um but also um she's recently uh it's recently been converted to an audio book and she uh, gave the introduction to the audio book and she, it was a really nice correlation actually. She said that when people feel overwhelmed by the state of things that if they can just find one small thing that they can do, it can, you can start to feel productive. So I really enjoyed the fact that something that I had taken from all of the learnings in the lead up to this exhibition is um, something that someone who is as knowledgeable and has worked in this field for so long is also encouraging. So that um, that felt like a really nice connection, actually. Um, so thinking about climate change, it's not something that I had directly engaged with within my own practice previously, um, but of course it's something that's on my mind because my work is about trying to figure out how to be um, a human in this world and how to engage earnestly, um, how to connect, how to connect with place, how to connect with people, how to connect with sites, how to um, embrace art as a facilitator of that connection. Um, and so, of course, this is something that has um, become more and more important to me through that investigation. Um, it's not, it's not at the heart of my practice, like some of the artists in the exhibition, um, but that doesn't mean that I guess it doesn't feel important, if, if that makes sense. Um, it definitely feels like an important part of navigating our current times. And um, I, I admit that I'm not necessarily uh, doing that in the way that I hope all of the time but this in you know in a way my text works operate as a as a tool to connect with the audience as a tool to connect with whoever's looking at it but also it's um, my text work 
often operates as something that I am telling myself as well. It's um, it's something that I'm telling myself and something that I'm then wanting to share when I feel like it's a positive, um, a positive kind of phrase or whatnot. And so that's kind of how I got to um, this particular text for the work. So sometimes it's the little things was through this how can I, as a very flawed human being, um, engage with this incredibly important topic in a, a real and honest way and in a way that is um, possible and so it um, and a way that is hopeful um, and, yeah, it just kept coming back to me that um, I've looked at this, this phrase, sometimes it's the little things prior in my practice um but it was a, a completely different um uh, a completely different meaning for me at the time and so to bring this into the context of climate change and, and how we can engage with the world it felt like a way to be engaged and positive and that's um, the more I sat with it in response to these big big ideas um, it felt more uh, purposeful and um, connected to where I wanted to start engaging with these um, with these issues. Um, so yeah, that's how I came to that particular text. Um, I think you know, being an artist can feel like the opposite of engaging with climate change. Sometimes we're producing things, we're, we're putting new things into the world and at times I have to remember that I'm just one person and um, that it's not the individuals that are creating this chaos, but we as individuals can, of course, um, try and be better in the way that we engage. And that's one of the reasons I really like neon because it's glass, um, it's fully recyclable, the steel that the work is situated on can be recycled, can be reused. Um, I'm very glad that this work will have a life past this exhibition um, and, you know, it can, it can live on for decades, um, which is fantastic. It's not, it's not instantly waste material, I suppose. So that's something I do think about. I try not to use um, other forms of light in that way. And, you know, it's a, it's a small way that I can think about producing artwork um, in a thoughtful way. Um, so that's something that I definitely want to continue exploring within my work. Um, I'm here in Bergen because I, um, I'm studying my master's at the moment in fine arts and I'm looking at the landscape and I'm looking at uh, impact of industrialization on the land, but of course not through the lens of engaging specifically with climate change, but very much about how do we be here, how do we um, navigate this world, uh, and I think that it's um, there are a lot of correlations between what's happening in Norway and what's happening in Australia as well, which I um, feel gr very grateful to be here to. Um, navigate those topics of course the difference is that people tongue-in-cheek and they don't really mean it but they will say that climate change may be good for Norway which of course we understand is not um, not correct but just in terms of um, yeah particularly in Bergen where it's the rainiest city in Europe you know these things can be a bit flippantly um, navigated but that's certainly not I don't think the consensus of people here so it seems that there is a lot of research happening in this city about um, how we can navigate these these important issues um, and I hope that's helpful all right thanks um, yeah once again um, thanks so much um, to to Courtney for pre-recording that um, that talk for for us. Um, so we're um, next up. We're thrilled to have um, Robert Andrew with us. Robert is a descendant of the Yaru people, whose country is the lands and waters of the Broome area in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. Robert often combines programmable technologies and machinery with raw materials minerals and um, other natural materials such as ochres, rocks, soil and water. 
um, a process of unearthing reveals hidden stories while reflecting on the politics of the management and extraction of natural resources in Australia. So once again, we're going to begin by um, sharing Robert's studio tour for Final Call, um, and then we will have him with us live after that. My name is Robert Andrew. I grew up in Perth, um, Western Australia, on Noongar country. Um, I'm a descendant of the Yaru people from the Broome area and I now live in Brisbane on Turrbal and Yagara country. Um, that's, how, does it, how does nature make me feel? I think revisiting now in, in childhood growing up was it was just one of those things that that was the everyday almost that and being around nature and being around sort of the bushland and sort of untouched bushland which was really nice to to run around but you didn't appreciate it that was just the everyday and now for me to be that realistically living in a city you lose a great connection with that and we have overlaid our own little natural reserves all um, within the space which I still enjoy that but I think it's the the difference in time within a natural environment being able to to not just wander but to sit and then sit for a period of time where you start to see things you never would have saw by walking through or having that same pace but it's that there's a moment where I think it is a, it's really difficult to explain, but I, I try to do it with some of my works, is just to slow it down to a pace where it doesn't look like it's moving. But as soon as you get into that time, you see a whole lot of other things happening. And, and I think that's what happens when I go sort of into, I, I suppose, into bushlands and sort of um, down the beach when I get back home and things like that, is just to stop and go into that different time if I can and just to see other things that I just don't see normally in everyday concrete boxes. Yeah, it's a frequency of resonance where everything yeah. has these cycles and that we see or don't, or we start to perceive these different cycles. And they could be like waves crashing, that's a cycle, but then there's also the tides of the cycle. And there's these micros and the macros of cycles. And it's just, we've got a very narrow awareness of those a lot of the time, those cyclic events that happen within within our environment and there's some of these cycles that are even sort of hundreds of years long that we probably never perceive in that way but these other daily cycles like as you say the waves breaking against the, the beach and then understanding that it's not a random thing you sit there for a while and you you start to see it feel it hear it and be totally aware of it yeah. So we're um, really fortunate to have Robert um, joining us today um, and um, to talk, uh, to expand a little bit on the work that he created for Final Call, which is called Temporal Landscapes. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Robert. Ah, thanks, Megan, and thanks for the wonderful introduction with that. I don't know whether I can, oh, I'll, I'll try to add some more to that, um, that production that was um, part of that intro because that was... Um, really, really well done. And I'd like to also um, acknowledge the wonderful country that we, that sort of I'm on at the moment and I've travelled through um, for the Cubby Cubby people and all the, the wonderful sort of, um, I suppose the environment up here is a, a little bit different to where I am down in Brisbane, but it's um, it's it's also acknowledging, the, I, I suppose, the, um, the traditional knowledge systems that course through the lands that we're on and um, to take that time to actually um, sit within that is, is, is an important part for this project and, um, and for my work in the different places I um, install the work or um, make the work for. It's, it's sort of responding um, and this work I think 
does it um, to a great deal. And I, I sort of spent, I think, a few days sitting on the bank installing the work. But the work is to I'll, I'll sort of give a rough idea or sort of rough explanation of what the work is doing and, and how it evolved um, over, the, over the months of preparing for this exhibition. And also some of the, I, I think, um, some of the issues I think I had within resolving that within the place once I was here. Um, so the work is, a, it's, I, I use a lot of, I suppose, electromechanical devices within my work and uh, so sort of kinetic works and they're kinetic time-based works. Um, and this is no different. It's, it's a work that, although it's, uh, other works will build up or erode over periods of time using water or um, eroding sort of soil and revealing what's underneath. Part of what I, I do is um, and hope to do within the work is to create um, moving and living landscapes that slowly evolve or continually evolve um, through the course of the, the works um, exhibition time um, and sometimes live on beyond that. So this, this work is it's like a, a Cartesian plotter in a way in a very small scale. Um, and it's sort of housed on one side of the bank and you, you sit on the other side of the bank, but within that, it's, it's tracing out a, um, an old word um, that talks about everything we see um, on this country. And it, it also deals with um, time and space within that as well. So it's, it's not a word that I want to, that you don't see materialize in any way, but it's, it's sort of, it's an, for me the um, language words have a lot more than just their translated English meanings. There's there's knowledge systems within every word, um, and these these words that were born from the, the country they came from um, uh, are deeply enriched with that knowledge. I feel so. This this word is traced around, and if you're on the other side of the bank, you'll see. The mechanism moving around, um, just moving around, and if you're on a very quiet day, you might even hear the sort of the hum of the, the the motors, the stepper motors, as they move around and create their own sort of sound as they go around curves or straight lines. Um, but within that movement, um, it's actually moving a very small. Um, sort of a pipette type of a nozzle, which water is um sort of ejected out of at seemingly random point so you're not getting this um as it's tracing around the word, word the, the water moves across and you, you get this sort of air time of this stream of water um every now and then and this this time can vary from four in a second to one in 10 seconds or something like that but because it's it's varying it's it's range you're just getting these these wonderful moments of water that sort of hit the, the, the still water that it's projecting out onto. And from that, you're getting sort of the ripples of the water, which are creating landscapes to themselves. But this conversation between that, that water and itself, in a way, I'm, I'm sort of using these gestures to, to mark, make on the water, these ephemeral gestures that sort of, in combination, they constantly change um, the water, and it's not a it's not a, a overly, overly dramatic um, work. And this was something I, I struggled with in the in the install was sort of how far do you take this to being something that you have to really sit on the platform for a while to, you, you'll see it, but then it takes a while to actually immerse yourself in that, I, I suppose, that time that it's creating for you as it's moving around. And um, because it is, isn't a pattern in a way that you can perceive, and I've, um, I've intentionally done that, it is moving for the word, but it's not as, as it's projecting out, it's, it's sort of tracing that word, but you can't see that it's, it's these random spurts of water that will land sort of close or far away or 
um, in this sort of within this area of the viewing platform. So part of that is, I mean, it's that, that conversation. I think it's that bringing you into that time and that conversation with this this one element that, as mentioned in, in other talks, that it, it's, it makes up a huge part of, of us and the world we live in. It, it is the thing that makes this planet inhabitable um, and alive. So it's, it's sort of, for me, bringing that attention to this very important and I, don't, I sort of, I still don't know the right word. It's a sort of entity in a way. Is I don't like calling it a resource because it's not a resource. It's a, it's its own thing. It's almost a, a it's a living thing that exists everywhere. So as you sit there, it's it's for me. It's just I I, I hope people get into that time frame. I think of the work um, to discover. Um, what might be seen, not just within the water and what it's creating, but around that, the other cycles that happen and the other patterns that are happening all the time there as the wind goes across, it changes as well. Um, so I, I, I don't, I suppose I see as, as an artist, my role isn't to be overly didactic with things, but just give insights into small areas and in places that might not have been looked at in detail before and sort of I think it's and, and part of that is looking at social climate change, cultural climate change and political climate change as well as the sort of climate change in the world. So yeah that's I, I um, really appreciate the opportunity to be able to do this work and be part of the exhibition. It's, it's, it's full of the wonderful artists and people that I've been working with and it's been more than my typical experiences within the realm. So, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, and um, I just wanted to thank you for creating such, um, such a gentle work that really interacts in a, such a light way with, um, with the environment. And I would encourage um, anyone, if they are in the vicinity and have the time and can get to the gardens, to, to visit and to sit on that platform and spend some time with the work because it, um, I personally found that it really slowed me down. <laughs> um, and it was, um, it, it's, it's a joy, absolute joy um, to sit with it and have that time. So thank you. Okay. Um, so next up um, we have with us, we have Arnie Helena Goulash, Judy Watson, um, and Tor McLean uh, for a little bit of a panel discussion about working on country. Um, so Judy Watson's matrilineal family is from one year country in Northwest Queensland. Uh, Judy's process evolves by working from sight and memory, revealing indigenous histories, following lines of emotional and physical topography uh, that center on particular places and moments in time. Ani Helena Goulash is a Kabi Kabi Gabi Gabi woman who has worked extensively in First Nations affairs, both within government and community. She established and is principal of Helena Goulash Consulting, which provides Indigenous arts and cultural management expertise. Uh, and Tor McLean is an artist uh, living and working on Yunnabara country. Her practice is a quiet reflection on the embedded histories and stories of materials and objects. Working across installation, video and drawing, Tor extrapolates these embedded histories through gestational processes that change and transform them. So we're thrilled to have you all with us um, today. Um, so for final call, Judy, Tor and Helena work together on In Between a K and a G. Suspended amongst the trees near the lagoon are these large artworks that are made of fabric. Um, and these floating painting, paintings are muddied with earth from the region, as well as rusty detritus from uh, Judy's nephew and Tor's partners, uh, knife making. Some of the paintings are inscribed with scientific graphs that chart climate change impacts and forecasts. Others bear spectrogram visualizations of Kabi Kabi language. And then more spectrograms and Kabi Kabi words are stenciled in mud um, and wrapped around the concrete water tanks and on the floors of the two of the shelters um, in the gardens. And it's sort of like they, um, 
they're sort of almost a beginning and an end or punctuation points to the work, the beginning and the end of that journey. Um, so for this panel today, um, Judy, um, Ani, Helena and Tor are going to talk about their work in relation to making work on and about country um, and how they achieved this in what I think was a very collaborative and respectful way. Um, but before I hand over, we should have an opportunity for some questions um, towards the end of this discussion. So if you have any questions for the panellists, I'll just encourage you to type them into, um, into the chat function on the Artsfront platform and send those through, um, and I can field some of those at the end of the discussion. So I'll hand over to you. <laughs> Nara, hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, Nara. Um, I'm, I'm sitting on Cubby Cubby Country and so are Judy and Tor and Megan and everyone here. And um, we're going to talk about how we work together on this wonderful project. Um, I'm happy for Judy to lead off and then Tor and myself will come in. But I, I was very proud, I am very proud to have honoured our cubby cubby ancestors, our old people. And it was, um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. It's been a collaboration that has been filled with um, trust and respect. And I'd be happy to talk more about that later. I think um, the fact that I have known Judy for a long, long time and have the utmost respect for her in terms of her practice. Um, and also I've known her on a personal level. So I, I do, do trust her as a person and as a, as a professional. So that was very important in terms of me feeling comfortable about taking the steps of um, working in collaboration and, and sharing, sharing some of our language and knowledge and, um, and sharing it with Judy and Tor, but also with the public. So I'll, I'll let Judy come in now and um, just great to be here. Well, it was a real privilege to work with you, uh, Auntie Helena, and with Tor, of course, and using Dan Watson, my nephew's detritus, as in the rust as part of the work as well. Beautiful country to work on and a stunning place to engage and look at how there has been a transformation of the landscape and of the plantings and things just within the lifetime that the Maruchi Botanic Gardens has gone ahead. It was fantastic as well as um, spending time with um, Ani Helena and others to also have the import of the scientists who were very generous in giving us uh, access to some of the climate change graphs, etc. And then, of course, Ani Helena in terms of uh, language and the title between a K and a G is looking at that spot, that slippage that often occurs within uh, Indigenous Aboriginal languages and others too probably, where it's not one or the other, it's in between. And so maybe Ani Helena can um, explain about that a little bit more in terms of kabi kabi gubby gubby language. As an Aboriginal woman, my country is one year country, Northwest Queensland, running water people. And so I am a stranger coming and working on this, on this country here. And of course, it's really important to be very respectful and to try and learn something about language and culture and country. And one of the words that Ani Helena gifted to us to use was dala or lungfish, which I think is a very fantastic and amazing metaphor for our position at the moment during climate change, lungfish being able to live on the land and in the water, and also being something which is very iconic and very rare within uh, this, this space. So I'll pass on to Tor now. Hi, um, I just wanted to begin by saying thank you to both of you. Um, it's, it's greatly inspiring to be able to work alongside two amazing, strong women who are 
pioneers. They're amazing in both of your fields. It's been a huge privilege to be able to um, be trusted to help put this project forward. Um, yeah, and Auntie Helena, um, you know, we, we haven't known each other very long at all, but it's been um, very, very special to get to know you and to, um, to have been trusted with your language and to be able to put that forward to the public, as Trudy said, you know, these words are so special and sort of, I think the, the day that we stenciled them up in the gardens and you came down to have a look and <laughs> um, that was a, it was a really amazing experience to sort of see your reaction and to have that, um, I think, yeah, and sort of, I guess I, I can't speak to the, um, the theme of working on country from a First Nations perspective, but what I, I, I can do is listen and I, I feel like my role in this project has been to listen and um, I hope that I've, I've done that for you. <laughs> And I yeah. think, Annie Helena, you mentioned that you, uh, as you came through and saw the language, uh, you felt, felt tingly all over. And I think that is the best response of all. I'm so happy that uh, that you felt like we achieved something that was within your dreams that you entrusted us with. And I hope that people, when they see the language stencil, will say those words out loud and learn them. And I heard that uh, some people, their kids are saying it out loud. So as we all say those words out aloud, and I hope we do that, anybody who comes this afternoon, let's do that together so the country knows us and responds. Over to you, Aunty Helena. Okay. Um, um, thank you very much, Judy and Tor, for all your warm words. And Tor, it was um, an absolute pleasure to work with you. Tor is a wonderfully gentle spirit and, um, and incredibly talented person. And because of Tor's connection, relationship to Judy, um, I put my trust in her, but it was actually very easy because she's such a lovely, lovely soul. Um, I did want to go back a little bit in terms of Cubby Cubby Peoples. Clearly, um, I'm very passionate about our connection to this country. And I think it's important to to really emphasise that Cubby Cubby peoples were, are the original artists from this country. And our old people, the creative um, cultural expression was always connect, about connection to country. And it was in, uh, integrally entwined with the environment and also with um, scientific knowledge. Um, Cubby Cubby People's science is being recognised globally in terms of the climate challenges. And it is being acknowledged that there is a lot that Indigenous peoples all over Australia, but all over the world, there is a lot that Indi Indigenous knowledge systems have to offer in terms of our incredibly difficult battle with climate change. So there's a lot of, lot of practices that um, have continued here on Cubby Cubby Country for um, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of years. Things like tr traditional burning practices, slow burn, very, very different um, to the hot burn and amazing, amazing knowledge right across the spectrum. So our, our creative practices, cultural expression has always been integrally connected and expressing all of that for a very long time. And it, and it is interesting how um, Judy talked about between a K and a G. <laughs> um, I, I love our language um, and I'm very keen to always be emphasising that Within Cubby Cubby language, like all Aboriginal languages, and um, as I understand many other Indigenous languages and other, other languages, there are often sounds that are in between 
two letters within the English alphabet. And with Cubby Cubby, we spell it K-A-B-I, K-A-B-I. And that is our, that's the preferred spelling that the majority of our group has chosen to use since about 2011. Um, and that's for native title purposes and for formal, you know, acknowledgement of Cubby Cubby, the word. And before that, we had the larger group decided to spell it as Gubby Gubby, G U B B I. And that that is still used by many people. And essentially, it's people's choice what to use. Language is a whole other story. It's very complex and, um, and very exciting. And the feeling that I had when I did walk up to, to the, the tanks and the other cement um, structures out at the gardens and saw the stencils of the words, I wasn't sure how I was going to feel because I'm often hesitant. Um, there's been so much taken in terms of cubby cubby cultural knowledge and um, and sometimes not used in the right way. The the whole issue of cultural um, and intellectual property rights is very important to our people. So I was a bit hesitant, but because it felt so right with um, Judy and Tor and with the rest of the team, Leah and and Trish and others, it seemed as though it was definitely the right thing to do. And to see the spectrographs of the words that I recorded there um, and, and the, the spectrographs and the stencils of the actual words, it actually, it actually just created this amazing a tingling sensation all through my body and, and felt amazing. And it's been a wonderful uplifting and stimulating experience and also very healing, healing process. So it's been a pleasure to be involved. Great. Uh, and should I, I would just like to put an invitation out there because at 3.30 this afternoon, if anybody's around the University of Sunshine Coast Gallery and wants to help us with some stenciling of Cubby Cubby Gubby Gubby language, we're going to be stenciling some of those words and possibly some of the negatives of the spectrograms that uh, Leah Barclay assisted um, uh, Tor and um, Ani Helena Goulash with onto the concrete around the gallery. So if you want to come and get down and get dirty, please. <laughs> <laughs> Does anything else you would like to touch on in relation to um, the collaboration or the work um, the resolved work. Maybe we could describe how the, the works on material were made. So, for example, the climate change graphs were collected and then projected onto uh, different pieces of fabric. One of them uh, is, I think, Diana Merritt was calling it the Duna Dirt fabric. So it was a Duna that um, actually Dot Watson's um, daughter-in-law was given. So just pieces, that, uh, there were cotton sheets from op shops, there were other materials that had been bought, uh, climate change graphs, etc. cetera, project, projected on, traced and painted in. And Tor, maybe you could talk about the process with the, um, yeah, um, yeah, the slag. <laughs> so there's, so we, using the leftover iron filings from Dan Watson's knife, making. Dan Watson, Instagram, <laughs> Dan Watson Knives. <laughs> um, so it creates this kind of uh, fine dust and we, um, well, I, I traced out the climate change graphs and outlined them with this, you know, slag and activated them in a process of vinegar and kind of allowing them to cure for a couple of weeks and it creates a kind of crust on the surface that will slowly corrode away into the material creating a negative over time and it's this sort of way of burning in into the surface of these panels the the climate change graphs and other ones were eco dyed so we collected um eucalyptus leaves from around the area and Sort of embedded them into the fabrics as well. And uh, other ones have been dragged through the mud, the, the soil. 
So that's impregnated into the material also. And I had a team of people also working with me in the studio in uh, Brisbane. Uh, for example, Ebony Wilmot, um, Lisa Carmichael, Dot Watson, Joel McLean. Maybe. Joyce Watson. Joyce Watson. Don't know. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> she's always there. <laughs> so there's been there's been many people who've had uh, assisted us, and of course, Ani Helena uh, singing um, language, and then the spectrograms being becoming this almost like a spiky sound wave that is translating. And I love the fact I really wanted them to be around the water tanks because the water tanks are holding the water which is a precious jewel within our environment, whether it's a body of water, whether it, it's the springs, the, you know, the, the rivers, the creeks, uh, it's something which is contained. And like we are, we're walking bodies of water too. And it's that resonance between the water, the spectrograms on the outside, it's almost like it's uh, a shimmering sort of resonance uh, recognising almost the sound ripples within, you know, that have come from many, many thousands of years of Cubby Cubby uh, people, you know, speaking language on country and suddenly you're seeing this translation of it on the outside. So I, I, I think it's worked really, really well. Mm. Not saying. It's <laughs> and, and, wonderful. And, and the colours, the, the colours, exquisite. Mm. Um, all the colours that you've achieved. I particularly like the the colour of the spectrograms and the and the word stencils. It's um it's a very rich colour and and quite ochre like, even though it isn't actually ochre. And yeah, just looks absolutely beautiful. And I I I really enjoyed the whole process. I mean, it was it was just amazing to see the visualization of sound speak spoken word and and song um and it's something that yeah has really resonated with me and i'm looking looking forward to being able to explore it in different ways with with hopefully other cubby cubby peoples but um, i'll say one thing too is that the trees are working for us the trees are working really um, hard in the space you know they are sucking in you know the carbon dioxide and you know sending out the oxygen they're doing going through their whole process and they are also projecting light and shadows and patterns via mm -hmm. their leaves uh when the sun hits the material which has got the climate change graphs or the spectrograms on it it's moving through and it's doing its whole projecting mm -hmm. thing so don't think that you're going to see the same thing every time you walk through the gardens mm -hmm. you're going to see a myriad of projections of light and air and wind all our natural sustainable technology is in evidence in the gardens and maybe talk and also talk about how the dirt paint was made oh yeah we um... can i can i just jump in for one, yeah. one moment we just have one question and um and i think it's a really great one um and we've only got a couple of minutes left um, and the question is, what advice do you have for artists working on country for the first time? So I thought that might be a nice one to, mm. to address. Be respectful, listen and engage and also give back, pay the rent. So when you think about working with, um, you know, some, whether it's uh, an Indigenous uh, language group, land council, people or whatever, Think about what you can give back to them because they will be giving so much to you. It doesn't have to be in a monetary thing, but I think that's fair enough in terms of paying administration costs or, you know, just, just general costs. If there's money in a public art uh, work or if it's a school or whatever it is, whatever you're doing, try and think of some recompense because you are going to get so much and you always need to have that exchange. What do you think, Tor? I, I couldn't agree more. Um, mm. Yeah, listening. <laughs> Listening and asking questions, um, you know, being respectful of those things and, and definitely paying rent. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. And just from a traditional owner perspective, we we really we really like it, appreciate it, and and we 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 do want you to think about you know making contact with traditional owners when you're coming to do this sort of important creative work on our country, and particularly those of us who are part of 
the creative community, but um, also elders and it, it's very important to us um, so that we can we, we can connect and we can make it real so that it is it is part of honoring our ancestors, um, those of us who are here now. Um, so we put out a big, big plea to how important it is to connect up and and it can it can grow and um, develop in so many amazing ways. Look, known Judy for a long time when she started to suggest some collaboration. Initially, I was like, oh yeah, and thought it was going to be you know something fairly small and um, yeah, it just it just totally drew me in. I am a frustrated artist, by the way. Um, it totally drew me in um, to a world that really soothed. Um, I've been through a lot of grief recently and it was really soothing. And I think the, all the, en the energy of everyone that we worked with, it, it all just gelled, came together really well as though it was meant to be. So that's that's a lovely lovely experience to have where um, not everything we're doing in the everyday, um, particularly in terms of traditional owners, um, constantly advocating for recognition and rights as well as wanting to take more responsibility. We're very keen to revegetate with a lot more of our native species. You know, the trees are so wonderful. Look, look at what they do, what they have always done. And it seems to be so easy, doesn't it? it? It ain't rocket science. Plant more trees and plant more native trees that were originally there on country. That's it for me. So it's been lovely to be here today. Yeah. Um, we're in a different room in case you didn't work that out. <laughs> and I just want to thank um, all of you for so generously sharing today. I felt really privileged to be witness to the collaboration that happened um, with you and it was extremely special. Um, so I want to thank you for sharing that with a, that experience with a wider audience today. Um, and we had a really lovely comment come through on the chat, which was um, someone saying that they're really looking forward to seeing the work later today. Um, and that listening is an art form and, and one that we need to practice more often, which I thought was um, a, uh, a sentiment that's come through um, in, in the discussion today. Um, and also just to reiterate, um, the stenciling will be happening outside the gallery at USC from 3.30 um, today, um, I would encourage you, if you can, um, to register via the Eventbrite link for this afternoon's um, on in-person um, activities, uh, and you can find a link to that from the Arts Front platform. Now, we're going to keep Arnie Helena on the line um, to talk about another project that she is co-curating, which is Carby Carby Connections. But I'll bid a fond farewell to Judy and Tor. Thanks for joining. But I just want to say thank you to Megan and Amy and everybody else within that team. And, and Leah. And, and Leah yeah. and uh, Tim Birch and everybody who was involved. So thank you for all the, the help and support and documentation too. I'll echo that. And everyone who's been mentioned, including you, lovely Megan, mm -hmm. you've been part of the amazing energy surrounding this, this mm -hmm. project. So thank you. Thank you. Arnie Helena has been working on, um, she's co-curating a project called Carby Carby Connections. Um, and it's a new media work that creates visibility for the stories of Carby Carby people um, and contemporary representations of country. So I think there's a, we're about to share um, a short um, preview of that. Um, and then Arnie Helena is going to be back on the Zoom um, to talk about that in a little bit more detail. <laughs>
Nara. Hello, everyone. I'm back again. Uh, that was a short introduction to our beautiful, beautiful Cubby Cubby country. Uh, so welcome to us sharing the integral connection between the contemporary cultural expression by our artists today and our incredibly beautiful and powerful country. You saw there the diversity of the country. Cubby Cubby country is huge in terms of stretching from one end of the Sunshine Coast to the, the other. Includes um, uh, the, the amazing hinterland, Mary Valley, Conondale Ranges. And you saw some of our monolithic ancestral beings in that introduction. So there was the beautiful Coulomb called Mount Coulomb. It's actually a rock. And it has the same significance as, our, as Uluru does, same sort of significance. And connected to Coulomb, you also saw Nindiri and Majimba, the small island. And you also saw some of the Tibrugagan family, Tibrugagan, the father and Biwa, the mother mountains, known as the Glasshouse Mountains. We've, um, we've been working on this projection. This is um, still a work in progress. It features some, a small number of Cubby Cubby artists, their works, paintings, and it is, um, it is our, it's a demonstration of our passion about how strong the connection to country is. Cubby Cubby peoples, our, our ancestors are still here with us. Our, our knowledge, our cultural knowledge, our histories, our science, it's all embedded in the landscape. Everyone talks about how beautiful the Sunshine Coast and Hinterland Ranges area is, and it is. And we keep reminding people that we love talking about the wonderful environment up here, the wonderful landscape, and it's great how the Sunshine Coast is marketed in that way. But we would like to see a stronger Cubby Cubby presence, Cubby Cubby Gubby Gubby presence in terms of um, whenever there are features about how wonderful this, this part of the world is. And this is part of us increasing the exposure of that incredible connection that Cubby Cubby peoples have had for tens and tens of thousands of years. So we're going to show um, a few short snippets of the video, um, which showcases one artist at a time and their work. And um, I am ready, I think, now. Law of the Land, the title. Um, Lyndon is an incredible artist, and you've already seen some of his um, some of his cultural strength and power in terms of his dance and and as a speaker, and now in terms of his painting, Law L O R E. Cubby Cubby peoples, like other Indigenous peoples around Australia. And, and overseas globally had uh, complex social structures and what was at the heart of those structures was the law, L-O-R-E. We're going to move on to another talented artist too, 
um, Bridget, Bridget Davis, a different, different style of work and also very powerful. And um, we'll move on to that now. The painting is titled Songlines of Malula. The Malula River is one of the powerful sacred rivers along our coast, coastline and hinterland. Beautiful work again. And the, the, the exciting aspect of Indigenous art in Australia um, Indigenous art, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art, art and artists in Queensland, here in Southeast Queensland, is the diversity and the richness. And we have, we, we've endeavoured to demonstrate how the works today are still, uh, are still drawing upon those incredibly strong cultural connections. So we'll move on to a work by another wonderful artist, Hope O'Chin, titled Gowanas. And if you spend any time in the national parks or through the bush on our country, they're very friendly. Well, San Gowanas. Our country is so diverse. It has been changed a lot. We originally had a lot of rich rainforest areas, which provided vital resources for our peoples. Today, Kabi Kabi peoples, we, we are here. We want, our, we want our presence to be much stronger. And the power of art is, is such an incredible way to increase that presence or strengthen that presence. And the artists that, whose work you're seeing today, um, not hearing from them today, but, but another time, hopefully, um, their, their works give, give you a feel, an idea of how we can start to raise the profile of the fact that Kapi Kapi peoples have always been here, we always will be. This is Kapi Kapi country, Kapi 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 country. And we are looking forward to more and more of our people having a much stronger presence here on our country. We will have time, I think, to show you the fourth artist's work, Morris Mikolo, another wonderful artist. This work is about the beautiful and powerful area, the Maruchi River, Coolum, Nindiri, and Majimba. And there's a very important storyline there, and it's also part of powerful song line that continues. The black swans, important part or one part one part of the story. So thank you all for being here today, and I hope that this has um, given you a little taste of amazing Kabi Kabi country for those who don't know it, and also for the the rich talent that um, we have in terms of Kabi Kabi artists and and their passion about expressing their close connection to country today. We look forward to um, our arts growing in this area, in this, on our country, and to building a really solid foundation for future generations. We have a lot of young people coming up and many talented. And so you'll be seeing, seeing a lot more of them in the future. But four wonderful artists, Lyndon Davis, Morris Michelow, 
Hai Pei Chen and Bridget Davis. Thank you.